All right, so I've got 45 minutes, now 40 if I stay on schedule, um, and I can probably talk for longer than that, but we'll see, and I'm going to try and watch the clock. I asked our LDML group, what do you want me to talk about? You gave me 45 minutes to talk about whatever I wanted. What do you want me to talk about? And they said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then I gave them a couple options, and they picked this one, and so this is what you get, and if you don't like it, it's the LDML group fault. Uh, blame Cheryl. That's who we're blaming. Um, and so I call this a presentation, which is the first time I'm giving it, so we'll see how it goes. Um, what are they doing with the Bible? And what I've got is, um, we're going to start with a couple of quotes from articles that came in newspapers around Easter time. Um, one from a very liberal perspective and one from a conservative perspective, both terrible articles. Um, and then we're going to sort of talk a little bit about um, what does your pastor do, what do you do when you interpret the Bible, and then what's going on in the wider world. So when you encounter articles, when you encounter people who are kind of putting forward a very odd or very different way of viewing Scripture, where is that coming from? What are the roots of that? Um, how did this get moving? Um, so, you know, we're starting to see things like, um, now I know there's, there's been, um, for example, feminist interpretation uh, for a while now, but it's even shifting more into something that you wouldn't recognize from even 30 or 40 years ago. We're having queer theology, the LGBTQ theology is coming from somewhere, and they are sort of stating we're reading the Bible, where, but they're reading it very differently. And so how, does, how do they get there? What's going on behind that? Um, we're having what's called critical theology. Um, so I know the big watchword in conservative news media and stuff is critical race theory. You've heard that phrase over and over again. Well, critical theory and critical theology share some similar assumptions, and those are all sort of going together. So that's kind of the roadmap. I'm going to try to explain that a little bit to you, sort of see, in a sense, I want to stand back and see the forest and where it's growing in weird places. Um, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to open up for questions too, so if I lose you or if you want to get a little bit more detail, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to all of you smart Lutheran ladies. And so um, let's jump right in, right? Um, so I have, so the first thing was in the New York Times on the week of Easter two years ago. They interviewed a seminary president. So this person has a Master's of Divinity, teaches and administers a seminary on the East Coast. Listen to our answers to these questions. So the interviewer asks, Happy Easter, Reverend Jones, to start. Do you think of Easter as a literal flesh and blood resurrection? I have problems with that. Seminary president responds, When you look in the Gospels, the stories are all over the place. There's no resurrection story in Mark, just an empty tomb. Those who claim to know whether or not it happened are kidding themselves. But that empty tomb symbolizes that the ultimate love in our lives cannot be crucified and killed. For me, it's impossible to tell the story of Easter without also telling the story of the cross. The crucifixion is a first century lynching. It couldn't be more pertinent to our world today. Interviewer, but without a physical resurrection, isn't there a risk that we are left with just the crucifixion? Crucifixion is not something that God is orchestrating from upstairs. The pervasive idea of an abusive God father who sends his own kid to the cross so God could forgive people is nuts. For me, the cross is an enactment of our human hatred. But what happens on Easter is the triumph of love in the midst of suffering. Isn't that reason for hope? Interviewer again. Isn't a Christianity without a physical resurrection less powerful and awesome? When the message is about love, that's less religion, more philosophy. She responds, For me, the message of Easter is that love is stronger than life or death. That's a much more awesome claim than that they put Jesus in the tomb and three days later he wasn't there. For Christians for whom the physical resurrection becomes sort of a, an obsession, that seems to me to be a pretty wobbly faith. What if tomorrow someone found the body of Jesus still in the tomb? Would that then mean that Christianity was a lie? No, faith is stronger than that. 
Well, I bet you didn't hear that on Easter Sunday. <laughs> uh, so, that's that one. Okay, now that's liberal theology over there that we would sort of call that. Now here is political conservative so that I'm picking on both sides because I do recognize I live in a blue county. You can't just, you know, <laughs> lambast one side of these things. So here's the opening paragraph from a conservative uh, politician newsletter thing. The celebration of Easter provides us with the opportunity to take a step back and reassess our lives. It gives us the chance to contemplate who we are and what we aspire to be. Given that Easter commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we should take advantage of this opportunity to reflect on ourselves and delve deeply into our minds in order to discover what brings us fulfillment and ultimately what our mission is in life, our purpose. In the same way that Jesus Christ led his disciples as his purpose and is now praised for it, we too should uncover what it is about ourselves that we may celebrate and that we may ultimately change the world. Is that what we celebrate Christ for? Not so much, right? Neither of those things did you hear on Easter Sunday. And if you did, you gotta, let, you gotta tell Pastor Stock, he's the circuit visitor. <laughs> so, those are the sort of things being published around Easter in the secular news by those who claim to be both Christians and Christian leaders. And those were just two that I found on the first page of Google. You could keep searching and finding all sorts of things. And one of those was in the New York Times, one of those was on blog, they're everywhere. And so if you don't encounter that, then you're probably just not reading the news, which is fine too. Um, but there's always something in a Time magazine, there's always something in the New York Post, always the week before Christmas or the week before Easter that says, oh, Jesus wasn't really born or this didn't really happen or something like that. So how does this occur and how does it occur in the church? So that's kind of the big question for today. So let's start with what or how do you read the Bible, right? So I think that most of you have recognized that your pastor does something different than you do when you read the Bible. Have you discovered that, found that, that he seems to be bringing something more or something different to the text than when you sit down and read it, you're not always finding that same answer. And the way I like to describe that, it's the difference between a chef and a home cook, right? You're a chef, you go to a restaurant, and you have a nice meal, it's well seasoned, it's sort of perfectly there, they've made it really well, they're using special ingredients that you don't find at the supermarket, they've brought in new things or these things, they're experts in, in cooking. And the home cook, they get stuff from the grocery store, they may be good at a recipe or two, but their, their span of recipes isn't maybe as large. Um, they don't know what to do with some ingredients, which you can see, I don't know if you watch cooking shows and the competitions like Chopped and they bring in all these crazy things and they're supposed to somehow make something with a kumquat in 20 minutes, you know, and yeah, I, I, I see the baskets, I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. Um, but yet at the same time, you're still making food, right? So a lay person, a home cook can make a wonderful meal, sometimes more satisfying than the chef can, but the chef is sort of the expert. Uh, and so that's sort of the difference, I think, because we're both reading the scriptures, but we're using different tools. Maybe our knives are sharper, um, different techniques, those sort of things. And so what we're doing is called exegesis. Oh, you know, I come prepared because there are <laughs> three or four. I have to throw it, otherwise I'll pick it up again. <laughs> Exegesis. And what that is, is pulling meaning out. Yes, this is my handwriting. No, it will not get better. <laughs> Ask my wife. So, exegesis is pulling meaning out of the text. You're going to look at the text, you're going to use different procedures, different tools to pull meaning out. So, that would be things like original languages, Greek and Hebrew, looking at the dictionary, looking at sentence structure, its context, its rhetoric, 
its um, historical and geographical considerations. Um, so for example, um, I'm sure you remember the story, Jesus goes and he preaches in Nazareth to his hometown, and he says something to them, and it makes them all mad, and they're going to throw him off a cliff. Uh, the text is usually translated a hill. They're, they take him to the side of a hill, and they're going to throw him off. Well, my mother went to Israel in February, and she visited Nazareth, and she got to see the cliff, and she said, it's a real cliff. If you fell off it, you would die. You know, it's not getting pushed down a hill. It's the city is on top of sort of a small, small mountain, large hill sort of thing with a real cliffside. Uh, living in northern Indiana, everything is flat. Your hills are... So, knowing that geographical consideration, that sort of thing, the way the, the ground is, uh, that helps interpret things, right? It helps you have a better picture of what's going on. Um, a historical thing, and I, I have yet to find a real uh, documented proof of this thing that I'm about to tell you, but some other pastor said it, and I have to trust that he's right, um, that when John the Baptist is eating locusts and wild honey, it's not bugs. You might think locusts are bugs, but in Israel at that time, locust was a seed pod, and so they were called locusts, but they were actually little seed pods that you could pop out and eat the seeds from them, and those were locusts, not the crawly bugs. But I've always had in my mind the crawly bugs, and that's gross. Um, but I haven't found anybody who says that in a book. So I have to find a book that says that before I say that with 100% certainty. But that's a historical sort of thing that you bring to the text, and once you say, okay, he's eating seeds and honey, not bugs and honey, you're less grossed out. So those are sort of the things that we're doing with exegesis, right? We're pulling meaning out of the text. And then there's another big fancy word. And I used to misspell it all the time. Minutix, minutix. I always mixed up this vowel right there. And that's a big fancy word for how do we understand the text. Um, now, you might think there's not much difference between those two things. And for a while, that was true. But we're going to see how this, this begins to change. So understanding the text, this is for Lutherans, for conservative Lutherans, for Lutherans that sort of put themselves in the tradition of Luther and the theologians that come after and the Missouri Synod, um, we are operating mostly out of a theology of hermeneutics. So the way we understand the text is governed by what we believe about Christ, God, and the Trinity, and the church, and all of these things. So if, um, if you are using exegetical tools and you come up with a story that doesn't fit within the theology, you go back and fix it because you have to guide yourself by your theology. If you come up with saying Jesus really wasn't God, you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out where you went wrong. Okay? So hermeneutics comes... This is just a fun fact that I learned the other day. The word hermeneutics comes from the god Hermes, whose job was to relay messages from the gods to people. And so hermeneutics is the process of moving from God's word to the people, sort of that application aspect. Okay? So understanding, and I'll throw in, just for clarity's sake, application. So those are sort of the two big words that I'm going to then start explaining how things have shifted. For us as Lutherans and your Lutheran pastors, we have procedures in exegesis. We have tools. And our understanding and application is guided by a particular set of theology. This is why your pastors will learn systematic theology and exegetical theology, which is a fancy way of saying all doctrines and what to do with Greek and Hebrew. Uh, that's what a majority of our classes are, and then some of the other ones are, you know, try and learn how to preach every once in a while. Um, so, those are the two things. Everybody following along with me? Everybody get what we're going? All right. It's good when we're staying in the land of comfortable Lutheran stuff. Let's get weird. Ian, 
in about 1850. Well, maybe a little bit before that. There were two shifts that have occurred in, in scriptural understanding in exegesis, exegesis and hermeneutics. The simplest way to describe what happens is the Bible goes to college. By that I mean the Bible is taken from the church and brought into the academy. And the academy, or college, is at the time part of the Enlightenment. So when we look at, for example, the um, best way to understand the Enlightenment is the founding fathers of this nation. They grew this country out of the ideals of the Enlightenment, uh, the ideals of uh, objective truth and uh, that human has, humans have good reason that they can discover how the world works. Um, and we also see a decrease in God and religion. So it uh, begins with a guy named Descartes and it goes from there. And I don't need to tell, rattle off names that just make me sound smart, but I will if you want me to sound smart. Uh, and so um, what we find in the Enlightenment is a desire to do a couple things. One is to be objective. One is to be rational. And one is to be universal. That's three, by the way. I... So we want to be a objective. We want to be rational. We want to be universal. And so we're going to be objective about the Bible. So we're going to get rid of the theology. What if we read it without the theology? What happens? What if we read it like a regular historical book? What if we read it like Homer? Or if we read it like, um, now I'm blanking on all the ancient literature that I'm supposed to have read. Uh, so you have the Odyssey, you have Iliad, and you have Thucydides' um, history, and now I'm just trying to come up with things that, again, make me sound smart. Uh, and so you have all that ancient literature, and they have a field for ancient literature and classics, and so they put the Bible into that category, and they start dissecting it and taking it apart and trying to understand all sorts of different things. And so what we start to see is treating Scripture not as the church, but as the academy. Okay? And so one of the big things in the Enlightenment... One of the things that flows out of this is what's called historical criticism. Have you heard that phrase before? This is a somewhat Lutheran phrase that we still talk about because in the 50s and 60s, historical criticism came to the Missouri Synod. And um, it had been starting elsewhere, but Lutherans are slow to change obviously. And so, though it had been going on for 50 to 75 years, it had began to be in the seminaries of the church. And there was a question as to whether or not it was good. Uh, is historical criticism good for the church? Well, no and yes, but mostly no. Um, some historical criticism is helpful in that one of the projects of historical criticism is to put the text into their historical context. Okay? Now, where might that be useful? Well, in a sermon, I don't know, six months ago or whatever, I was talking about um, Suzerian vassal treaties of the Babylonian and Assyrians. And you might think, well, why would he do that in a sermon? And the answer was to put my people to sleep. No, it's because the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, and the, its surrounding text is built in the same way as an Assyrian, or it was actually a Hittite Suzerian vassal treaty. Hittite Suzerian vassal treaty. So they had done a lot of work on archaeology and the Hittite culture, and they discovered that when 
Hittites would conquer a smaller tribe, they would make an agreement with their king or their leader, and they would become a vassal, and they'd pay taxes to the Hittites who became a suzerain. Okay? And that there, were, there was a form structure. There were four things. And when we look at Exodus chapter 20, because the Israelites are entering into a land that was previously occupied by Hittites and had interactions with Hittites, that God uses a familiar form to them, and they make the Ten Commandments, and then where God is the suzerain and the Israelites are the vassals. They, the God will take care of them, he'll provide for them, he'll protect them militarily, they will obey his commands, they will uh, worship him and obey his word. Okay? Now, you didn't know that about the Ten Commandments, and most people didn't until the sort of historical criticism and archaeology began to develop. And we're like, oh, that's why we have God calling upon the, the heavens and the earth to be witnesses. Oh, it's because you have to have a witness for the Hittite-Suzerian vassal treaty. Okay, so that's helpful, right? We can add history and geography and, and background. Where it's not helpful is something like this. There's no way that Moses was smart enough to write five books about a variation of topics. And so what actually happened was that these five books of Moses were written in four or five distinct historical time frames over a period of about a thousand years, and they were put a piecemeal together. And around 500 B.C., you finally get the five books. Well... That throws a lot of things out the window, doesn't it? And so historical criticism, for the most part, said the Old Testament is not history. It's not true. It's not what really happened. And that became the, criti the, the, predominantly th the predominant thought in the academy, in colleges, in seminaries, in institutions of learning at Princeton and Harvard and Yale, Divinity Schools, all these different places, and for a time at Concordia St. Louis. And so this also then applies to the New Testament. You get things like the resurrection didn't really happen, the apostles didn't really write the New Testament, Paul didn't write his letters, Matthew didn't really write Matthew, it's 250 years after Jesus died, they're not eyewitness testimony, all these sort of things come out of historical criticism. And it sort of throws the text into, in a sense, what that first seminary president was talking about. It doesn't matter if the resurrection happened or not. It's not really about history. It's about love and faith and trust and hope and those sort of things. So, that's a problem, right? That's the problem of enlightenment and what we call modernism. So we're, in a sense, most of us here are modernists, and that this is where we grew up, this is what we kind of think about, um, and how we think about things. Not just scripture, right? So we're not modernists when it comes to scripture. We're modernists when it comes to life. Are there objective truths in the world? Yes or no? Yes. Can we be rational about things, and think about things, and examine things, and scientific method is good? Right? Yes, we would say that. Um, is there, does everybody have the capacity to reason and to think and to speak to each other and communicate? Yes. Uh, so there's this sort of universal, rational, objective understanding of the world. So that's, we, we are modernists in everything except religion. In religion, because we're Lutheran and we're LCMS, we're still a bunch of medievalists, believe it or not. We didn't change much from the 16th century when it comes to our theology. Uh, that's why we're confessional Lutherans. We're still holding on to the confessional documents of 1580. That's when the Book of Concord was published. And so your pastors are still stuck in the medieval age when it comes to the Bible and how we understand it. Now, is that a bad thing? I don't think so. Um, and... Believe it or not, people are starting to go back to the medieval way of thinking. 
Um, and they don't call it that, they call it something different. They call it the theological interpretation of scripture. Um, but it's what we Lutherans have been doing for the last 500 years and they're starting to think, hey, maybe we're right. Uh, which is a hard thing for a Methodist to admit, by the way. <laughs> just, I don't know if you've met any Methodists. Uh, I'm just kidding, my grandmother's a Methodist, I love her. I uh, wish she was Lutheran. Uh, so, that's 150 years ago to 50, 60 years ago. However, there's a reaction to modernism over the last 50 years. How am I doing on time? I'm doing fine on time. I'm doing great. I was worried. Just so I don't get lost. I'm making it up as I go anyway. What we have, as you may well know, is we have what's called postmodernism. Which, by its very name, has a relationship with modernism in that they consider themselves after or different from, and so it's somewhat defined in reaction to. Now, I had up here objective and rational and universal. They're going to go in the opposite direction. Things are no longer universal. They are instead community. Things are no longer rational, but um, we'll say it this way, self-determined. And things are no longer objective, but subjective. You might not think that you are postmodern, but I'm going to test you. If, let's say here, I look at name tags, let's say Susan reads Luke chapter 4, and Lori reads Luke chapter 4 in Bible study, and though they are creatures of habit, they've come to two different understandings of what's going on in Luke chapter 4. How do you determine who is right? Can they both be right? Yes, they both can be right, right? So you, if, if you're in Bible study and the pastor's talking about, uh, oh, I don't know if that was a hint or not. But no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't pick on his members, evidently. Um, and so, uh, let's, I'm trying to think of a text that is semi-controversial. I had one this, on past Sunday, and I'm not going to get into that, because that was a whole 15-minute, you know, energetic speech about why I was right and they were wrong. Um, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't happen very often, right, Cheryl? I don't go off and tell people that I'm right. Um, I like telling people they're wrong, though. Um, so, ah, here's a, here's a perfect example. Parable of the prodigal son, right? Everybody knows that parable. Um, what do you focus on, right? What's the real point of emphasis of the parable of the prodigal son? Well, sure, you might say forgiveness. I might say uh, a lack of caring, right? So, what, so when we ask the question, this is, a, this is a fun one, why was the prodigal son hungry? Give me some answers. Why was the prodigal son hungry? He spent all his money. Okay? Why else was he hungry? Anybody? There was a famine. There was no food in general. That's why he was hungry. There's another one. In the text it says no one would give him anything to eat. So why is he hungry? Well, because he spent all his money on whores. That's what his brother thinks. That's what his brother says to his father. He's, he wastes all his money on women. He wasn't there. He doesn't know. But yet we kind of take that because we think we see it all the time. We see a bunch of people waste their money on all sorts of stupid things. So we, we hold on to that. But if you've lived through a famine, you know it doesn't matter how you spent your money. Everybody's hungry. But if you live in a culture where hospitality is most important, 
and you have to take care of the stranger and the foreigner, the fact that no one gave him anything to eat speaks poorly on the community. And that's why he couldn't have any food, because the community didn't take care of him. Three very different answers to why they couldn't eat. Which one's right? Well, it seems like the community you're from, the experiences you've had, change the interpretation. How very postmodern of you. Because that's what kind of the postmodernism will say. They will say it's, you can't find an objective answer to that question. It's instead <clears throat> subjective to what your experience is, what your community is like. Um, does your community prize proper stewardship of funds? Well, then you're with the older brother. Is your community all about community uh, hospitality? Then you're with that other line. Are you with, or have you experienced a famine or a drought before? Well, then you may pick up on that. Um, and so there was a, I read a book, guy talked about it, he took that question to different countries, and that's how he discovered this sort of phenomenon that when he went to African countries that had dealt with drought, um, that was the first thing that, or it was actually, he went to Russia. He knew about, they knew about famines in Russia and shortages of food, and that, you know, it, it's the drought. It doesn't matter if he was a good steward or a bad steward. No potatoes means no potatoes. Um, so that's a subjective way of reading the text. We have to sort of deal with our own experience and community. Community, subjective, self-determined. Now, that's an oversimplification of what's going on in the world, but a helpful example for you to kind of see what's happening. I talked about how most of us view the world as modernists, as we see that we can experience things objectively, that we can experience things rationally, scientific methods a good way of understanding things, exploring things, gaining knowledge. Postmodernism rejects all of those things, and what we find then is a transformation of four different things. And I put them over here, but I'm gonna put them over here. Uh, language, power, knowledge, and I'm going to put over here truth, and self-identity. These four things are radically transformed by postmodernism, and, as I will also call it, Critical, uh, I'm trying to think of a, and it's not thinking, because critical thinking is a modernist phrase. Uh, I'll just put critical philosophy. My bachelor's degree is in philosophy, in case you wanted to know. You didn't really care. Um, it just means I've read a lot of boring books. And so, critical philosophy then governs these dynamics, and so what are some examples of this in the world? Or what is it doing critically? So what is it criticizing? That's the better question I wanted to ask. What is it criticizing? It is criticizing modern assumptions of objectivity, rationality, and universal nature of the world. Okay, that's what it's criticizing. So when we're talking about, for example, critical race theory, what they're doing is they're criticizing the modern understanding of race relations. Okay? That someone could be objective and rational and universal on their way of thinking about others. They reject that notion. And instead, they're critical of it and think that there are dynamics that we are not considering in the conversation of race. So I'm just going to use this for example because it's the topic of the day and no one's probably ever explained it to you in what they're actually saying. Critical race theory basically says the language we use about race is determined by the community that's speaking it. English is predominantly a white language, <coughs> right? It's English. It's from England. We're all pale and white. Um, I'm especially pale, see? Um, I glow in the light. Um, 
and so even language itself is based on your community. Power is determined by who gets to determine the language that's used, okay? And who gets to speak. Knowledge is not universal. It is in, neither is truth. It's determined by the community that you're in and the language that that community has, okay? Then you determine, you can't determine your own self-identity. You can't rationally think about yourself. Instead, you must understand yourself within the community and the dynamics of power and language. Okay, does that make sense? Not really, maybe a little, because it gets weird. Now, if you get that, you can start to see the ripple effects. Not just in race theory, but in general understanding of yourself, your community, your people. For example, why does transgenderism seem to explode in the last 10 years? That's sort of odd, isn't it? Because it wasn't a problem 25 years ago. It wasn't a fad in the high schools to have all of a sudden 10, 15 girls decide they're going to be boys. That's new. How does that have anything to relate to this? Well, in the critical postmodern philosophy, you don't get to determine your own identity. The community does. And the community does through power and language. And so if we reject the notions of this boy, girl, gender binary, and that language of only male and female, and recognize that those around you are using power to put you in a box, then you are the victim who, as your community has been telling you what your identity is, you need to find a better community. And that's why you see it often called the LGBTQ community. Because the community dictates your identity. And so if you're not happy with what you are, you're probably in the wrong community. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's a ripple effect of how this ends up working. So, is some of this right? Well, a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. So for example, as someone who has learned another language, is anyone else here bilingual, for example? No Spanish speakers? Deb's not here. Are there are no German speakers. That's, uh, this is the crowd to know German. Yeah. All right, we got one German speaker. Great. Okay. Now, obviously there are two Greek and Hebrew readers in the room. Greek and Hebrew? Yeah. Oh. Oh, that, they didn't learn anything. All right. <laughs> yeah. Just me. I'm the best one. All right. Uh, here is... Here's a fun fact about language. But you have all the power in your face. I was getting to that. <laughs> it's second on the list. Don't, don't try to insert power here. Um, That's one of mine. <laughs> figures. Figures. There are about nine words, nine concepts, that are universal in all languages. Nine. Think of all the words in the English language. Think about all the words in German, all the words in Spanish, all the words in French, all the words in Greek, all the words in Hebrew, all the words in Swahili and in Mandarin. There are nine universal concepts. That's it. Other words aren't shared across language. And so there are things like if you're wondering what are the universal, to know, to think, to uh, an individual, so an I, me, you can talk about yourself, knowing, thinking, um, I don't know the rest of them. Um, but anyway, there's only about nine to, nine to ten. And so language dictates how you can think. If you don't have the words to express your thoughts, you can't have the thoughts. This, of course, is from, you, well, I just realized as I'm saying this, it's 1984. George Orwell's 1984, anybody read that? 
the news speak. If you limit the amount of words, you limit the amount of thought people can have. And it's true across languages. So if you don't, um, so what, when learning languages, um, and I can't speak to this myself, but I have a sister who is very good at taking Spanish, and you know she's very good at it. Um, and the key transition moment when you're learning a language is when you can dream in the language. So when you can dream in Spanish, that's when you've got it, okay? Because then you can start thinking in Spanish, and you can start thinking in Spanish concepts. And so if our language doesn't have certain concepts, then we can't think those concepts. And there's a guy, he's French. I don't know if that explains everything to you or not. Um, a guy named Jacques Derrida. He is still living. He's still causing trouble in the philosophy world. And this is his big idea that we need to de-shackle ourselves from language in order to think new thoughts. Um, which is somewhat true. It's what Shakespeare did, right? We didn't have a word for this until they came up with elbow. Shakespeare came up with the word elbow, but we just sort of ran with it. Uh, before that, we didn't have a word for elbow, and we just, I don't know, called it our arm, I guess. Um, but once you have a word for something, then you can think about it. So that is true. It's an aspect of language. Now we get to power. What does power look like? Well, power looks like being able to dictate the concepts that are allowed, the language that's allowed to be used. Um, and also, who gets to speak? I am exerting power on all of you because I'm speaking and not, not letting you speak. I'm sharing ideas in a specific language and jargon that I'm expecting you to understand. And so I'm exerting power upon this community. And that's because I'm a man and I get to. Uh, it's because I was asked. Um, but that's how that answer would go. Uh, and often ha as it has gone. And so then uh, if our concepts and our knowledge and our truth is dictated by language and power, then it's all community-oriented and there is no objective truth. Okay? Everybody following along? Making clear? Great. Now we're going to get into the Bible stuff, which is the whole point. And I'm already three minutes over, so whatever. You guys were late coming in. I'm going to talk <laughs> five minutes. All right? Give me five minutes to talk about how it comes to Scripture. And somebody keep an eye on that because I'm going to keep talking until I have to stop. Um, well, it wouldn't that be exerting power. Um, we're tired of this guy. Critical hermeneutics is what is now the, the theology that is being dictated. And so you take those concepts of um, community, language, power, knowledge, truth, self-identity, and you begin to look at Scripture with those lenses. What happens? Well, you contextualize. You say the language that's being used is first century language and older. It, and the Hebrew is older. And so they don't have the ability to communicate uh, to 21st century language. So we have to change the language. We have to change the way we interpret or, or uh, translate texts. Um, and so we need to be more gender inclusive. Right? They couldn't conceive of a God who wasn't male, and so they always use male pronouns for him. Uh, but we recognize that God is not body, but spirit, and spirit has no gender, so we're going to call God she, or it, or they, or whatever. Uh, and so that's an example of using changing language and concepts in, in history. Um, there, I've seen uh, one of the, I talked about feminism being radically different. Postmodern feminism, when it comes to theology, would say something like, the Bible is written by Middle Eastern men, and the theology has been dictated by men throughout the history of the church. And so there has been a de-emphasis upon the role of women and their suffering and their success in Scripture. Uh, how often do we talk about 
Tamar or Bathsheba. Uh, there's actually, and I think this is correct, by the way, um, there is a renewed emphasis on, when talking about David and Bathsheba, calling it a rape. Because there's never any blame put upon Bathsheba in the text. All the blame is on David. And so when we read that text and we see that when according to the Old Testament law, she would be at fault <clears throat> if it were a consensual um, encounter, then we should instead recognize that this was a rape by David. And that sort of changes even the severity. Like if we consider it adultery, we understand adultery between two people when their husband's away for six months, then okay, that sort of thing might happen. But it's hard to think about King David, a man after God's own heart, as a rapist, right? That, that's a bit more severe. Um, though it also I mean, it, it puts things into a different perspective. See, that's an advantage, a truth that I think is correct out of, in a sense, postmodern feminist biblical theory. They're pointing out things. Um, and so that's a power dynamic. Um, they're looking at power dynamics, and they're looking at how um, things are being expressed and what's being pushed down and what's being elevated. Because um, that's ultimately what power does. It gives rise to one voice over others. Um, and so that's one of those dynamics. Um, knowledge and truth, community, subjectivism. We've already sort of done it in one small scale with the prodigal son. But that's still within... Lutheran theology, right? All three of those answers didn't really impact our theology. It just impacted what we talked about. Um, and so if we're going to start really noticing or, or being critical of our community and how we establish power dynamics and the way we talk, uh, we have to look at what has our community pushed down? What are we not talking about? And why are we not talking about it? Is it because your pastor doesn't know anything about Malachi, or is it because he doesn't want to talk about some theme about, I don't know, slaves? Um, I don't think there's any slaves in Malachi. Uh, I don't have it memorized, but I'm pretty sure there isn't. Um, Philemon is a, probably, we, how often do you hear sermons on Philemon? Um, so those are some of the dynamics there. Um, and then self-identity, of course, um, becomes we get to determine what the text is all about. Um, what does the text mean to you is more important than what it means to the church or to the community. Um, so those are some of the dynamics. Those are some of the ways things start to um, pop up. I'm going to look at my outline for a minute and realize I didn't talk about most of the things I put on here, which is just typical. Um, <clears throat> 